go. <laughs> no, they can't get far. Escaping the realm of darkness. The paranormal guys are on a quest to find the answers to the hard questions of where the normal meets the paranormal and the weird and where the natural meets the unnatural. So grab your holy water, call your mama, and get ready for the Paranormal Guys podcast. Hello, everyone. Today's date is July 10th, 2024. It is summertime. And it's a beautiful day out, let me tell you. I have some news that I have to tell everyone. Steve is missing. Steve has been missing now for some weeks. And he went out to Nimblewood, Georgia to go searching. He was invited. He was invited to go out to Nimblewood, Georgia because he has he had an interest. He has an interest in Bigfoot and other cryptids as well as conspiracy theories, of course. And he decided to take these two, uh, the Jenkins brothers, up on their uh, invitation. So he uh, drove out to Nimblewood, Georgia at the same time I was driving to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And nobody's seen or heard from him since. And uh, it's, it's making me worry now a little bit. Uh, we haven't heard anything from him. Um, maybe it's just a signal. I don't know. I maybe I, I don't know what's going on with him. Uh, but uh, right now, Steve's missing. He's missing. Uh, I'm putting up this thing. Please help find Steve. If anybody sees him, uh, please uh, notify Neil at gravesideparanormal.com. Uh, info at gravesideparanormal.com. Um, hell, sell it, send it to Steve at gravesideparanormal.com. I get his emails as well. And Steve, if you're out there, you're hearing this broadcast, somehow or another, get to me and uh, let me know, man. I I, I got to know what's going on with you, man. Um, it, it, it's, it's really, really, really wrenching uh, to the heart, not knowing where he is at this time. But also at this time, I... I have a contract where I have to have these episodes go out. So at the same time, I'm kind of like, ah, do I do it? Do I not do it? And plus, I got you, the audience, our great audience. And Steve would want me to continue to move on every single week and put out these episodes, record these episodes. So I want to do that for each and every one of you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off the show just right. Uh, I actually, to continue the show... Uh, until maybe one day we find Steve. Uh, I, I, I have a man that I invited on to be my new co-host, uh, Mr. Scotty Rorick. Um, he is a medium psychic. He's been on a lot of shows. He's been on radio. Uh, he's very well known in the paranormal community. Just a really nice guy. Um, he's going to be my new co-host of the Paranormal Guys podcast. I hope Steve doesn't get upset or anything like that when he comes back. I'm sure we can all sit down, be men about this, and talk about this. But Scotty Rourke is now going to be the co-host until eventually we find Steve, and hopefully he's okay. So once again, uh, in the next episode coming up, it will be me and Scotty, and we're going to be talking with AJ True Crime. AJ True Crime, uh, he's going to be talking to us about his museum, his Chicago Museum, uh, on this first episode with uh, Scotty Rourke. That'll be uh, coming out the next one. This one here, this is, oh, this is going to be so good, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to be talking with Father Mike Maginot from the Demon House. You know, Zach Baggins did his documentary on that. Uh, very good. I enjoyed it. Um but we also got Mr. Brad Pate. Brad is a really, really, just really nice guy. He is the assistant to the exorcist. We had him on earlier this year. Uh, and I, me and Steve did. And we talked to Brad. Very interesting guy. Uh, very well spoken. Uh, just really, he's a deep thinker on it too. Definitely a deep thinker. Um, so this episode here is going to be about the exorcist and the exorcist assistant. Uh, Father Mike Maginot and uh, Mr. Brad Pate. Uh, now, a couple of things I want to talk about, since I'm not going to get into too much news, I'm going to talk about the things that are upcoming. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have this year, especially for our customers, for our Graveside Paranormal Ghost Tours. 
we are going to be having the seance at the Roth House in Watsika, Illinois. Now, what is the seance, you may ask? Well, it's a seance. But what we're going to be doing is we are going to be filming a documentary there, um, the seance. We are going to be doing it with Mr. Larry Eisler III, otherwise known from Paraflix um, Expedition Entity. Uh, me and him got together. We sat down. We talked. And I told him my ideas, what I wanted to do. Uh, he liked them. Well, thank God. You know, <laughs> and uh, I we sat down and we talked about this and we're moving forward and we're going to be I'm renting out three buildings. I'm renting out the Roth house for the ghost tours. I got ACG and Mr. Bob Anderson, as you know, from Bob After Dark, are going to be conducting the tours for me while well, I'm going to be going around and talking to people. I have rented out three buildings to Roth House. I've rented out the train depot, the old train depot, which is, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, when you see this train depot, you're like, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. It's an old, it's an original uh, train depot uh, from many years ago. And across the street from it, I rented out the old courthouse, which is now the Watsika Museum. So I rented out both of these. In the museum, you're going to have your psychics and your readers. In your train depot, you're going to have your vendors out there of the supernatural um, and whatever else they're going to be selling. I'm sure it's all going to be fine. I, I wouldn't let anybody in who's not going to sell something very, very nice. So we're going to have vendors in one area. And what we're going to do is the community is working with us where we're going to try to get people going and getting where they need to be. Everything at the seance is going to be timed where you can go for the ghost tour every hour on the hour. And then the seance with Mr. Miss Diet Renee. She is awesome. Number one, she's awesome. She's very nice lady. I had a long conversation with her uh, and Nick Sarlo's Spirits in the Spring. You know, just very nice to talk to. Um, I, I can't say uh, anything better than other than she's just awesome. So she's going to be conducting the seance for us at the um, at the Roth House, and we're also going to be doing a documentary, me and Diet, with Larry. Uh, before we do the seance, and it's all going to be blended together, and we're going to put it out for everybody. So it's going to be me, Diet, and Larry. We're going to be filming all this while all of you are there, and you're all going to be a part of this. Part of the thing is when you do this, when you buy this ticket on Eventbrite, you are going to give uh, the invitation that you're going to be a part of it, that you're going to give authorization, that you can be filmed audially and video and on the video. So you make sure that when you do get your Eventbrite ticket that you went and you filled out all this and you have to turn it in. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to turn this in. If you want to be on the video, if you want to be part of this documentary, you have to uh, put all that in there. So I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be October 26, 2024. Uh, it's going to be around the same time that we're going to be doing our regular ghost tours. Speaking of which, uh, we're going to be doing our ghost tours. Let me pull this right up here. Da, 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 da. Oh, let me pull this real quick here. Pararock. Uh, so I'm going to be at Pararock. Uh, this is going to be August 3rd. I'm really looking forward to this. Miss Allie K. Uh, we are going to be doing a live thing with Allie K. Uh, me and Scotty on um, July 24th at around 7 p.m. on Facebook. We're going to be talking about this. And we're also going to be doing uh, Truth or Boo Shizzy. We're going to play Truth or Boo Shizzy. So we're going to be doing that. Uh, me and Scotty are both going to be speakers at Pararock, at the Annex. Uh, that is in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it is, you can go to Alley K Productions on Facebook and check out everything. I really recommend all this. You got, number one, you got Dave Schrader. Dave Schrader is going to be there. How, what else can you get? I mean, you got Dave Schrader. This dude here, I'm telling you, he's a funny dude. I really do enjoy listening to him. I think he misses calling. I think he should be a comedian. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's knowledgeable what he talks about. But I, I, every time I go away and I listen to him and I go away, I, I really enjoy him. He's a very entertaining man. So that's what we're going to be doing with that. Uh, and then here is what's going to be happening soon. Uh, me and my daughter, we, we go over what our new season's going to be and what we're going to be doing this year for Graveside Paranormal Ghost Tour events in 2024. Once again, the seance at the Roth House on October 26th. All day, all night, uh, we're going to be doing this to 1 o'clock in the morning. So we're going to stop at a certain time uh, to, at 7 o'clock to start the seance at 7.30 and then start back tours again from 9 a.m. to about 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I have Mr. Pete Christ 
uh, one night at the mysterious Monroe house. Now this Monroe house, it is weird, man. It is really, really weird. Um, he'll be there October 19th. You can buy tickets to join him October 19th from 8 PM till about three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, you're going to be able to meet him there. Uh, the tickets are going to be limited. Uh, it's going to be either 10 or 12 tickets uh, inside the house. He's going to help you along, I'll give you some equipment. He is a professional. He's Pete is very good at what he does, period. Pete is one of the best. Uh, then we have our nightlife tours, which is actually going to start on October 11th, 12th, 18th, 19th, 25th, 26th. And they're going to be running from 7 p.m. to about 11.30 p.m. They're going to be still our regular nightlife tours that everybody just loves to come out for every October. Um, and I actually have Mr. Ed Levin. Uh, and I believe his name, his friend uh, Mike, I forget his last name, and I apologize for that. But he is going to be out there helping him because I'm going to be at the Roth House. So we're going to be doing all those things. And we will keep everybody notified. I have... Pay attention to our Facebook, the Graveside Paranormal Facebook, for all the speakers who are going to be coming out. I'm going to be putting it out in the next couple of weeks. I think this is going to be really, really cool. I got some really cool speakers who are going to be coming. I also have uh, Mr. AJ True Crime, who is going to be on the next episode, or actually, uh, yeah, the next episode, where he's with me and Scotty. He's going to be coming out to with his Paranormal Chicago Museum with all his haunted dolls, and you'll hear more about that very, very soon. Uh, so I have other ideas. I'm just waiting for people to get back to me on certain things. And I'm hoping to give everybody a really, really good time. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I want to present to you uh, the next episode is going to be Mr. Brad Pate, Father Mike Maginot, and this title is The Exorcist and The Exorcist Assistant. So stand by, ladies and gentlemen. I hope I gave you more than enough uh, information. And once again, if be on the lookout for Steve. If if anybody sees or hears from him or think you see him, you know, at maybe like a, a Bucky's or a Wally's or any other kind of place like that, because they're you know they're all up and down those areas. Those Wally's, but I love Bucky's by the way. Oh God, I love that Bucky's. All right. So until then, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, The Exorcist and The Exorcist Assistant. And like always, boys and girls, boo. And now, back to the Paranormal Guys podcast. All right, we're back. Tonight, we have Mr. Brad Pate, who has been on before. He is the assistant to the exorcist. Father Mike Maginot is with us as well tonight. We're going to be talking about things. We're going to get to know Father Mike. We're going to also get to re-know uh, Brad Pate. We're going to talk about the Demon House and many other things with deal with like possession and exorcisms. Uh, but like as always, I always like to get to know people a little bit. So Father, I want to bring you in and ask you, what, what brought you to wanting to become a priest? I think it started back in seventh grade when I was at St. Peter and Paul grade school in uh, Maryville, Indiana. And the assistant pastor there um, offered all the boys interested in the priesthood to take two days off of school and go to our Camp Lawrence, our summer camp, for a couple of days. And I think all the boys um, thought it was interesting to uh, find out more about the priesthood. So I think we all went. Mm -hmm. And But it kind of stuck with me. Yeah. And so then you just... After that, after going to this uh, meeting, you just kept with it and just kept forwarding in your life with wanting to become a... Did you become a brother first and then a priest? No, I'm a, a diocesan. So um, even though I wanted to go to our Catholic high school in Andrean, um, I would have to pay for that tuition. So it was getting kind of high. So I decided to save my money for college because I had to pay... Um, if I was going to go into the priesthood at least the first two years of college. So um, so I did uh, um, have like retreats and different things and then eventually signed up um, with the diocese and went my freshman year in college to St. Meinrad uh, Seminary College in southern Indiana. Okay. And what were your studies at the college, if I may ask? Actually, we had our president rector was a chemistry uh, PhD. So they offered their uh, BS in chemistry. 
And so, uh, so I, I uh, like science and math. So I, I went with that. Oh, okay. Now, when you were younger, uh, did you ever have anything supernatural or uh, paranormal ever happen in your life before you uh, started getting into the field of uh, possession and exorcisms? No, I wouldn't say I had anything uh, yeah, growing up or anything like that. No experience there. Okay. All right. Now, Brad, now you met Father Maginot. Uh, what year did you meet him? We met in 2014. Okay. Now, how did you two guys get together? If I may ask. Um, in, I actually was doing a case. I was just basically new in the really the paranormal field of trying to help people with spiritual issues. And in Southern Indiana, I had that case that uh, where uh, somebody was talking out loud, uh, like you and I are talking, but there was uh, other things going on. And I reached out to the priest in Indianapolis, that's the exorcist priest at the time. And he um, basically passed me off to just the, their local priest. And I went back to him for some help. And it just, uh, he wasn't really willing to help me on this case. So I, uh, January 2014, I was um, uh, reading the news and I saw... Um, uh, in the news, it said exorcist priest performs exorcism on a, uh, a child in Gary, Indiana that uh, crawled up the wall backwards. So right. from there, I was like, wow, you know, that's pretty impressive. So I want to compare his notes to my notes and maybe he can help me. So I found his phone number, called him. And the first time we talked, um, we kind of hit it off and I went and sat down with him and with my wife and um, we watched, um, we ate dinner and basically we hit it off and we started working after that together. And it's Great, right? been, been very, very big at that time. Yeah. You, you, every time I speak to Brad father, he speaks always very highly of you. He, you know, I, I, you know, so it's been about 10 years. So you guys are coming on your 10th anniversary of being friends, uh, in, uh, the faith together. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's awesome. That. Yeah. We had it. Yeah, that's very uh, good. January or February, whenever we yeah. actually did meet. You guys should have a cake. <laughs> <laughs> it was my yeah. 50th birthday on Monday uh, or Sunday. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, so happy though. birthday to you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Monday. You know, we yeah, should get a cake that looks like the demon house. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was uh, definitely uh, a time when we first met. Uh, him and I went to the house for the first time and I uh, got to walk around the house when it was still there, and and uh, uh, it was definitely a treat to uh, be with Father. Uh, he's so knowledgeable, and he, he truly is a man of God. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I you know I, I've had wonderful uh, ways to work with people and uh, a family um, that's helped us in the ministry is a, a family in um, Napanee, Indiana, named Tim and Kena Fulner, and they have a paranormal group um, and. Uh, they've definitely helped us out too. And, and, um, uh, cause when we do the sessions or we have done sessions with people, they do get a little belligerent. And Tim has been very, uh, helpful in that aspect. And Kena has too. Right, right, right. There are some well, wonderful awesome. people. Uh, it's, it's, so, yeah, it's awesome that you guys have this good relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so you went into the house, uh, before Zach Bagans then knocked it down. So you were able yes. to go in there after the fact, after the family left and this and that, Brad. Um, no, I never got to go in the house. I only got to go on the outside of the house. Oh, only in the outside of the yeah, house. Okay. Only the outside of the house. Okay. All right. So why don't we get into uh, talk about the demon house a little bit, and then we'll move on to some other things. Does that sound good, fellas? Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. So for the ladies and gentlemen who don't know, okay, let's put this up here. This is uh, the Demon House right here uh, at uh, 3860 South Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. On November 2011, Latoya Ammons, her mother Rosa Campbell, and her three children move into a house. In December, December, mind you, black flies fl f swarm on the porch of the house. Now, you know about this, right, Father? Yes. Okay, so they tried killing those, that swarm of black flies. Am I correct? No, actually, they would uh, kind of they would die, and she would sweep them up. They they may have tried to spray something, 
but they would die and she would sweep them up. And then all of a sudden there's a whole mess more. And, and if they would spray them again, they would die and she, she would sweep them up. But that kept on happening till finally they didn't have to do that anymore. Okay. Let me ask you. So it comes from the, uh, the Wikipedia. I'm actually uh, going to the Wikipedia just to make sure I get things correct. Is there something that has to deal with flies or anything like that? Uh, I mean, because it is December. Mm -hmm. uh, is is that any kind of sign that there's something weird going on in the house? Yeah, definitely that is a sign because that's not the, uh, flies will be earlier in the uh, fall. You know, a big time is usually like around September or so. Right, right. If you had an infestation of flies, that that probably is their normal time. Right, and, and when they, they, say they, they go away. Yeah. yeah. And when they say swarm, that's a whole lot. That's over. At yeah, least quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That, you know, that's, that's really weird. Then uh, Rosa Campbell hears footsteps in the basement and doors creaking. Uh, what, what did she convey to you about this? Yeah, that was probably the next thing that they kind of noticed one time they were awakened and they saw someone walking back and forth in the uh, living room. So they, you know, came out of their bedrooms and turned on the lights and they didn't see anyone uh, except they saw muddy boot prints um, that were kind of pacing back and forth on the, you know, they, they saw that that was happening and it kind of went back down into the basement. So they kind of followed them. And so, and they checked around and, but didn't, you know, it, it underneath the stairs, um, it seemed to be coming from and then, then, and it, there was like an opening in the, uh, um, there's dirt underneath the stairs. They didn't seem to find anyone. And so they then put a lock on the door. And then later they would hear like footsteps coming up the stairs and try to open the door and then bang on the door. And then they'll go and look and, but never see anyone. Okay. But again, they would see the muddy uh, boot prints. Okay. So we have we have uh, these two ladies who are seeing a shadow in the house. We're getting mm -hmm. banging on the doors. Uh, we got a muddy footprint. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Brad, as well as you, Father, have either one of you ever seen a shadow person when you go to some of these uh, places uh, to do where there's a possession and uh, you have to perform an exorcism? Have you seen shadow people? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Brad is more sensitive than I am. I, I don't, I really don't sense too many things. So okay. I, I rarely see, if I see it, everyone sees it. Okay. Everybody sees it. Okay. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. If I'm seeing it, everybody <laughs> else is damn well seeing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I we, hear we've you. Had, we've had some houses that um, they, they like, um, uh, these these figures and um, what's really what's really um, great uh, is they don't like father at all and they don't they don't like me either but they don't like father at all for sure so I'm sure I'm sure well, yeah I've I've come across them many times um, for whatever reason they seem to always move left to right and they move very quickly uh when i go to certain places uh so that's why i want to ask you just kind of get a background of any kind of uh, uh eyewitness accounts that you guys have seen stuff like that and father when you went to the house and you interviewed them because you did eventually mm -hmm. go to the house because they they called upon you mm -hmm. did you notice anything odd inside the house yeah for the first two hours when i was conducting my interview and everything um it was quiet i didn't see anything um, I did bless the house with a very, um, I, I just did a normal house blessing uh, just to see, you know, um, if anything happened, nothing happened. And then I started to talk to them. They gave the whole story. But then they mentioned a strange thing. And that was mainly she had a, a boyfriend um, who kind of followed them around. Um, and, and, and in fact, she was, felt she was, he was stalking her and they thought if they got a new house, um, a new place to live, you know, he, he wouldn't find her, but he followed her home uh, from work one time and found where she lived. And so, um, one time she was at work and 
he came over and the grandmother was with the kids uh, and uh, asked if uh, he could give the boys a gift. And she asked, what do they want? What does he want to give them? And he says, uh, each $5, uh, you know, $5 bill. Uh -huh. And what was kind of strange with that is he didn't want to give anything to the girl. And, uh, you know, and basically what she said was that, yeah, the girl is good, um, but the boys need a little encouragement to stay good. And uh -huh. so, so she accepted that gift and, and it was that weekend after that, um, that things really went kind of crazy. So that always kind of intrigued me, uh, um, you know, what was all that about? Was, was and, the man... But, Go ahead. I'm sorry. But, but when we got to that point, that's when phenomena did happen in the house. And it started in the bathroom with the uh, light flickering and buzzing, like an electric sound. And, and I went over to look at it. And the moment I would get there, it would stop buzzing and flickering. And then I would get back and, and you know, try to get back to the boyfriend story. And then uh, it would start all over again. So it looked like I was reacting, trying to even interrupt. And so I went back there again and did the same thing. But this time I was walking back. I said, I guess it's scared of me. And then this time it was flickering and, and, and kind of being defiant. And actually I went to it. It kept on going. I even went to get my crucifix and I put it on the light. It kept on going. So it was being defiant, you know, but then um, I just kind of sat down, let it keep do its thing. I was going, not going to interrupt me. I said, we need to figure out what, what's with the boyfriend. Then the next thing started to happen. And there were these rods on Venetian blinds that you'd twist to open and close them. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of swinging back and forth in the kitchen. And it was maybe going a half an inch each way, swinging. And I was, and they were pointing at that, which was another thing that would happen in the house. And so I could see that. And I went to look at to see what was causing it. Why would it be swinging? And then uh, all of a sudden the, the furnace kicks on. And there were also these like tags on the three little strings that you use to open the uh, blinds vertically. They were at the bottom there and they, they were fluttering. Uh, so I was kind of thinking, okay, that's, uh, it's the furnace that's probably causing the air currents. And then the furnace kicked off and then it stopped, uh, you know, the, the thing stopped uh, flickering, the little tags on the strings, but the thing was still, the stick was still going back and forth and wasn't stopping. And then I saw on the next set of blinds, the same thing. They were kind of going in unison, it seemed like. Then the next one and the next one. And then I went all through the house and they were all kind of going in you know, like they're orchestrated. And then I got mm -hmm. to LaToya's room and I saw like this big, huge, like someone poured some liquid down the middle of her blinds. And and I, I looked at that. I remember seeing it before when I blessed the house and I asked LaToya, what's that? And she said, what, you know, that um, when all these things were happening, they had... Uh, a, a church come in to try to help her. They told her to put, uh, make the sign of the cross on all the windows and, and the doorways. But in her bedroom, she made a huge sign of the cross. But this was only the vertical part of the cross and the horizontal part um, wasn't uh, showing. And in fact, I don't remember seeing that, you know, and it seemed to be even dripping and I felt it. It, it was like, it was kind of oily. You know, so it kind of seemed so so it looked like it was manifesting at that time. So and, and actually kind of dripping. But, you know, so I kind of made a note of all that and sat down and, had, you know, said, well, I know it's trying to interrupt me. So I'm going to let's keep on going. You got to tell me about your boyfriend, about this boyfriend who's stalking you and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, the next thing she started to look down by her by her, where she was sitting and around her were like these um, footprints that were wet and manifesting. And they seemed to be walking around her, forming around her. And so I went to look at them and, you know, I could kind of scuff them. So I saw they're wet and such, but they seemed just to be around her, you know, since I went to the bathroom, since I went uh, to the uh, kitchen, you know, or, you know, came outdoors, maybe I stepped in a puddle, they weren't mine. 
and they and they weren't going out the door or or to any of the other rooms. It was just around her, and so and uh, um, so I made a note of that again, and then tried again to get her to tell her story, and 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 eventually started to uh, shiver and said, "Oh, I'm, I'm freezing." And so so she went into her bedroom to get a you know a blanket to put over her. And then, okay, and then I told, you know, it's so, okay, you could, what can you tell me about th this guy? And then she throws the blanket off and says, I'm burning up, you know, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and I said, well, okay, I know it's trying to interrupt you. And she says, oh, I have a headache, you know, and, and I kind of looked at my watch. I saw it was 1030. And so I said, I, yeah, and now she's kind of suffering. And so I decided, okay. I, let's uh, kind of conclude this and, um, you know, we'll get a good night's sleep and everything, you know, th and they were living at their, her brother's house at that time. So I didn't want to stay past midnight or anything. So I was going to just have her when she gets up in the morning, you know, later in the morning, just give me a call and we'll try to finish this interview. Okay. And so she left, uh, they, she left the house to go live over at her brother's for that night. Correct. Yeah, they, they were. That's where they were living at. Oh, they okay. they left the house for good, you know. About you know, after the boyfriend gave the five dollars, there was some trying to get some help from the local church and everything. And then finally, things got so crazy that they went to a hotel at, at the middle of the night. And then they decided to live with the brother from that time on, and that's kind of what got child protective services involved because the kids. Um, it was during the Easter spring break, you know, and then Easter came, but they were supposed to be back in school that week. And, and they never, um, the kids weren't showing up there. They, and so, um, so that's when child protective services were kind of getting involved with the, uh, with the family. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Captain, uh, Charles Austin, he came out there. Are you familiar? You're, you're familiar with yes. that? Now, yes. did he recently pass uh, the captain? I I believe I heard that. Yeah, I, I thought that I read that it. somewhere. Okay, um, yes. Can you take me into that of uh, the conversations that uh, you and the captain had? Okay. Yeah, I they didn't do anything at that time. This is more. Um, this is. Uh, let me. Oh, okay. I don't think I had any involvement with him until, oh, or did I? No, no, yeah, that's right. There was a time, yeah, we did get the police. The police were involved. They were called right. into the case. And then they called, yeah, then they, um, there were three uh, policemen. One was the chief of police of Hammond, who used to be, before he became chief of police, was in charge of occult um, cases in Northwest Indiana. And, uh, and when he became chief of police, he called in uh, Lieutenant Grushka of the Lake County Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, yeah. and he became kind of the paranormal expert. And so he was called in. And then we needed someone locally. And so uh, Captain Austin uh, came, became involved uh, from the Gary Police Department. Okay. And then after that, uh, DCFS was then called? Was it after seeing Captain Austin or uh, was it before? Was DCS? No, they were involved before because the kids. Now, now there was things happening. Um, the kids were having bloody lips and bloody noses and bloody gums and things like that, going to the nurse's office. And, and the nurse would look at them and then see nothing's wrong and send them back to class. And then we'll kind of continue again and, you know, with one or the other or, or something. And, and so, but they couldn't find a source of that. And then it wasn't until they were missing from school that they um, wanted a, a wellness check done by a doctor. And so they took them to his, uh, uh, their doctor, the child's doctor and, and the boys were kind of going crazy in the doctor's office. And that was a Thursday, uh, you know, after school, afternoon, early evening. And one got thrown into the wall and kind of passed out. And then the other was acting crazy. And then he also kind of collapsed. And so they called two ambulances to take the boys um, to the Methodist hospital. 
where you know the the family was uh, with them through the night and the one boy was uh, really needed to be restrained you know the youngest one who's seven years old needed to be restrained by five grown men orderlies and and policemen and such um wanting he wanted to kill people and all kinds of things like that right. and while they were all kind of dealing with him that now this was through the night into the morning um and then just the grandmother um, rosa with uh, the nine-year-old was there but there was a psychologist there there was the Ch child protective service agent there and there was a nurse there and all of a sudden he started to growl his eyes kind of rolled back into his head and they became white and 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 rosa was trying to coax him you're not i won't use his name but uh, you're not him uh, naming his name to come on back and uh and so um and she was kind of backing him up toward the wall and that's when he started to walk up the wall backwards and eventually uh flipped over her head and then sat down in the chair and then turned toward the people watching this whole thing in amazement and he had like this grinch like grin but his eyes were still white and they all ran out of the room and rosa stayed with them and then they got you know policemen and security and and you know you know other doctors and everything uh to kind of come in and basically they were trying to uh you know and at this time he was very coherent and everything and tried to get him to do what he did before and showing them how he did this and he had no idea what they're talking about so the young man he had no idea what just happened he said i can't uh, do that you so, know, he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know when, when, i know I, I he had no idea what what happened so you have all these professional people inside this hospital the Methodist yeah. church and now i was in the professional field for 30 years and i know that we always do like some sort of like little sidebar or something like that to kind of go what the heck is going on here before we give mm -hmm. a real opinion on something was there in because i believe there's a fine line between a possession as well as as well as a psychological disorder yes um it, there's a fine line between and i've talked to other people in the psychological field uh psych workers psychiatrists not all of them agree with me but a lot of them do was there like a sidebar where like and i'm gonna be a little humorous on this we're like oh dear lord that boy is possessed yeah no, actually, they knew that's not a medical condition or a psychological condition. That right. was something they have never seen before in their lives and no explanation whatsoever. Right. They I actually did call me, and I just happened to be on call for the normal priest who is the uh, chaplain there, but I would cover him on his days off on Friday and Saturday. So I was doing my... Um, Bible teaching uh, class in my living room in the rectory when I got that call. Mm -hmm. And I told them, it, yeah, it does. They, they wanted me to come over and do an exorcism. And I said, um, well, yeah, I have to get permission from the bishop to do all that. But you do have something that sounds serious. I'll, I'm willing to interview the family and, and, you know, give them my contact information and I will meet with them. And so, which is what they did. But it was later that day, the children were taken away from the uh, grandmother, mother and grandmother. And one was put into a child children's lockdown unit, uh, the youngest one where they were hold, trying to hold down and want to kill everyone. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other boy and the older girl, um, they were put into a foster care with uh, the Carmelite nuns in our area. Uh, now, these children today, uh, so this happened in 2011, so it's... it's Actually, 12. Th this was 12 when I got called in. Okay, so this is okay. yeah, April of 2012. So at the time, the children were about seven or eight years of age, so now they got to be yeah. at least 20 to 21 years of age. Yeah, they're all adults now. Yeah. How are they doing? Actually, they've been fine since uh, LaToya's final exorcism which I completed in June 29th of 2012. Okay. Now, Brad, uh, were you ever with father during any of the later ones as these uh, children got older? No, 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 at all. I mean, like there, there's been no incident that they've been fine. I, since. There's not. Incident. All right. I now spoke when... with 
Well, I, I, I talked to Latoya um, back in 2015. I was befriending her, and we were talking to see how she was doing and everything. Um, but after that, I hadn't talked to her since. So. Okay. Now, a couple more questions about the, um, the demon house. Uh, now, one of the ladies, uh, Miss Campbell, she was choked. Yes. Yeah, she was choked. Was she choked before uh, the young man uh, was taken to the hospital, or was this around the same uh, time? No, this would have been um, still um, – she, she never really liked being in the basement, and so – but she was doing the clothes one day, and I think it's the last time she actually would ever go into the basement again. And she was choked there and had to get out of there. And uh, and, and so there's something in the basement. I'm not going down there anymore. And so uh, so Latoya had to take over, you know, doing the the uh, washing of clothes. Did you ever feel anything like heaviness or anything down? Did you you went down into the basement? Yes, Father. Yeah, I don't really feel too much things. So, so I went in there and actually I didn't know there was that, uh, a place underneath the stairs. It wasn't until right. the policeman, cause I went and blessed everything, but I just kind of, you know, you just kind of bless a room at a time and, and go, go everywhere. But I didn't really examine anything. Um, you know, I saw they had a little altar and candle thing set up and, and such, uh, which, uh, the previous church, uh, kind of indicated and, uh, uh, to do and uh um but uh um when the police um noticed this dirt thing underneath um they called me about it when, when they did their um uh wellness check uh, on the things the situation there and and they they contacted me what i thought about that and i said oh i didn't know that that was there but that that's in that's serious um, they did mention a, a thing with the basement and all that, and we might have to see what is buried in there. And so they were going to, you know, get the permissions and everything because the house was being rented and such. So they had to get, you know, all this, you know, information. They were going to try to get a dog and different things like that. So a couple of weeks later, they did do that and then d dug up um, things from there. And and they did uh, dig up uh two sets of three objects each one was at two feet deep the other one was two and a half feet deep and what were these uh things that were underground so the first uh set of things seemed to belong to an older woman and so uh the first thing we saw was a fingernail like a painted pink fingernail we don't know if it was a real fingernail or an applique but it seemed to be old time and uh the next uh, thing was kind of uh, some sort of cottony underwear or slip. It was kind of torn and everything, but they were kind of concerned with that. They go, "Ooh, what's this?" You know. Uh -huh. So, and and then the third thing we found was this lid. It was an oval red lid, for some reason that was bent in half. And we then they were kind of looking for the container of this, see what was in that container, but they could never find anything else till they came to the next set of three objects. And those objects seemed to kind of refer perhaps more um, to a, a young boy. And, um, and the first thing we kind of saw was this metal bar, and it was heavy, and it had a hook on it, you know, kind of a little eyelet. You know, so we weren't sure if it's like to a grandfather's clock, but the, uh, the, the, that's when Captain Austin, he said, well, in these old Gary homes, it's either could be a counterweight to, uh, you know, opening the, uh, um, window or else it could be for a drapery cord to go through and you could open and close yeah. drapes. And so, and, and then we, um, next, uh, let's see. The next thing we saw, um, oh, was a sock. Yeah, we saw a sock. It was a cottony sock, um, but it looked like the, uh, it, we saw the top part of the sock, but the foot part seemed to be cut off and it was kind of frayed and such. And so we kind of thought that's strange. 
Um, but it was a boy's sock, but it wasn't, you know, the modern day, you know, polyester ones with stripes or anything. It was like a real something from the Depression or war era type of thing. So we have random objects that are buried underneath the stairs. Um, and then the third thing they were really concerned about, because then it looked like this long thing here. It was yellowish, could look like oh, like a bone at first. And so they were very careful with that, taking pictures and and sweeping it slightly and kind of seeing, you know, what's there and such. And they finally did tap it. It had a plastic sound. They kind of picked it up. And then they saw what it was, was one of these old time uh, shoe horns, you know, that you could, you know, stand up and hold, you know, but it was small. So it's kind of like for a child. And, and it looked like it was broken in half, you know, lengthwise, you know, so like the other thing that was bent in half, this one seemed to be broken in half. And then uh, we couldn't find anything else except, uh, you know, we got to about three feet deep and it looked like it was pristine sand, it wasn't roiled anymore. So it didn't look like anything else was bit buried. And people believe that the boyfriend that you were talking about earlier in our conversation might have done ritual things in the home? I don't believe he did had anything to do with that. It seems to have been done. Um, the kids would describe two figures. One was the seven-year-old boy was always talking to a boy his age that no one could see but him. And he then the boy would talk about, and he would like to be in the closet, in Latoya's closet and talk to him. And, uh, and he would talk about what it's like to be killed, what it's like to die, you know, and things like that, you know, they thought it was crazy things. Okay. Then uh, I have a photo here. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. I, I'm sure you have, of course. Hold on. Supposedly oh, yes. a figure in the window. How yes. This picture here, was this taken after the people left, the, the family left the house? Yes, this was taken by the police when they went for their wellness visit. Now they just, um, when the police um, took it, it, it was the Hammond police officer. He, you know, so it's uh, uh, the property of the Hammond police. And he just took a picture of the house. And it wasn't until later that he discovered there was a figure in there. Right. And so we believe that was probably, there was a, we kind of got into the history of the house. And we know that when it was bought, it was built in 1926 to a newlywed couple um, who lived there um, their whole life. Mm. And, um, and you know, the, the other thing, figure they would, uh, the children would see is this old lady in a white dress was in their back. All right. All right. Brad, do, do you see that uh, father stopped? Yep, I saw that. Yeah, okay. We'll just wait for him to come back in. <clears throat> Sometimes these signals. Did you Okay. Uh, you were uh sorry, Father, but you uh you you stopped for a minute, probably your signal and your Wi Fi went out for a second. Oh, okay. Uh just yes, start sir. off where the lady was in the white dress. Well, the lady in the white dress, the kids would see twice after school. The first time they went to her you know, you know, go into the backyard and say, hey, what are you doing in our yard? And then she looked at him with the red eyes. They ran into the house and oh, really? uh, told her whoever's she... there. Oh. And then the second time when they saw her, they kind of snuck into the house in the front and and told who was the, ever there to go look in the backyard. But they never the, they didn't see her again. But wow. that kind of, yeah. that's actually amazing because then we can rule out a residual haunting. Uh, for ladies and gentlemen who don't know what residual haunting is, just a playback in time through traumatic and dramatic things that happen in a timeline. That's that type of haunting. It sounds more like something that's intelligent. If it's if it's looking back and veering at these children, yeah. then it has some fo form of intelligence. It has a reason yeah. and a rhyme to what it's doing. Uh, so uh, that it's it probably an inhuman. Uh, okay. So it, that's very interesting. Um, now, what we kind of thought was that was the original couple, um, probably when the when they died, you know, that, that are still there. So we think the man is the digger, you know, who would do the blood, you know, the uh, muddy uh, boots and such, 
and he was the one that dug these things, uh, put them in. And the mother was probably doing the rituals or something. And, you know, and as an older lady, you know, so she and then the boy is, you know, perhaps the boy that died in the house. Uh, we could never verify, you know, they had any children or anything like that, though they must have had children because it was a family that did sell, you know, um, the, the house when both of them died. And uh, but it was never um, sold to anyone who moved in. It was always rented from that point on. But there were many renters through that history in the early 80s and on. So you believe that maybe it was possibly these original owners that may yes. have been, we'll say the word haunting. Yes. Uh, still this residence. Yes. And, uh, yeah, because that, that does happen, you know, because in life we all have choice. Right, Father? Mm -hmm. And I believe that even when we die, we also have choice that we can choose to want to stay or uh, go on to that next realm. Uh, yes. And that's called an earthbound spirit. So if they're sticking around and they're not happy with who's inside the house, they might be interacting with these people in a negative fashion. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you telling me that story. Now, I want to get back into uh, both of you guys for a second. I uh, talking about you guys. Uh, so what was actually the first case, if you can tell, between uh, the both of you, uh, Father and you, Brad, that you guys worked together? Can you guys talk about be the uh, gypsy graveyard? That's probably it. Uh, yeah. 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 I think that that might have been our first case. Oh, that sounds just intriguing. The gypsy <laughs> graveyard. You know, that should be like a book. <laughs> that yeah, it good. seemed to be this angel would move around. It was kind of in the center of the thing. And, uh, and you would find it in a different place anytime you would go and visit. Oh, wow. And so, um, so we were going to just bless it um, when we had uh, evidence of it. Now, when we went to bless it, it we couldn't find the angel, you know, at least in the beginning. And then I did my blessing, you know, and, and you know, I let Brad kind of go through and kind of do his thing. He, he could describe what he does. And then I, I just kind of go in with incense and holy water I'll, I'll bless it with holy water and then just kind of go around with incense and we did see this little like baby angel way in the corner off the by this fence you know oh. kind of huddled there but we don't remember seeing it before but that you know but you know it, it, it was we were wondering if this is you know it, it actually was a really big angel so we we're kind of surprised so it did have a cool angel it? corner but it was a it's like a stone like thing really so, Brad, what did you see? Did you see the exact same thing Father did? Yeah. Wow. Um, but you saw some other things. Yeah, I saw, uh, talking about shadows, There's a there was a big black shadow at the entrance um, of the, um, the, um, um, the entrance of the actual cemetery itself. It was like it was... It was a little bit taller and it had a top hat person had oh top really hat. really yeah they call those the hat man yeah <laughs> or it could have been like an old uh, residual thing of an undertaker you never know man mm. yep. you never know it's about a 200 year old uh uh um, cemetery you know before really almost or about when indiana was just becoming a state so it goes way 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 back so it's and called the gypsy cemetery yes and it seemed like uh, only, you know, they wouldn't let the gypsies use their, their cemetery. So they kind of had a, so they were kind of, it started out, they were kind of buried there. And they were segregated. They to be cursed. You know, no one really wanted to be messing around with it too much. But, uh, yeah, but uh, and it kind of had a long history of, 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 of folklore. Yeah. That, uh, what what got you to both of you guys to go out there for that? Did someone call you? Did you guys just yes. father called me? What's that? But, but I yeah, there were these two. Yeah, there was two ladies who were interested in our ministry too, and you know, and uh, and so they said they had this. They were kind of called in to try to solve this mystery, 
and you know themselves and they went and they couldn't really do too much with it so they asked if we could do anything with it and so we did we um okay let's we'll see what we could do see what we could see and uh and uh and i guess uh, i haven't heard any more stories on it so but, yeah and they said yeah they don't remember anything you know being calmed down i'm a little reluctant to say things because it's very easy it's open to anyone and so yeah, before no, there I, would always be people who like to do you know things in the middle of the night with candles and things so yeah we really I, don't, don't want to kind of invite that yeah no i get it i totally understand so we'll, we'll move on to the next thing then so then after uh that one there um the brand first you, the first exorcism case we had was i traveled to uh phoenix arizona to pick a, to check on a lady a lady contacted father about having an issue she gone to her diocese in arizona and uh, she was having some issues and from there um i traveled out there and um i basically brought her back from arizona to to help her and father did the session on her and um that was a that was a pretty crazy case because the aspect that um i actually brought her in in a wheelchair because she was so frail and from there after all the sessions were done uh we did the sessions for about three to four weeks i believe and um she she actually walked out of the church like a normal person except she still had some uh some issues that she had to deal i believe psychologically was but yeah we we thought we did as much as we could do with those things correct. and the rest was psychological with her yeah. father or something like that so yeah now, when you when, when you two gentlemen go into one of these um sessions that you're going into you're called out do you try to go in there with feeling no emotion whatsoever like you guys have to stick by a certain thing that way you don't get upset you try to keep emotion out of uh, the exorcism. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, there are rules and in, in performing in a, an exorcism, um, which are yeah, the devil's going to try the demon you're doing you're dealing with is going to try to stop it in any way he can. And he's going to play with with those things to yeah. try so to. Can, see, yeah, ahead. so if he could get you angry, if he could get you scared, if he could get you sad, get you quit, you know, he'll he'll do it. He'll try all kinds of things. Okay. We'll see if it, he could stop it. Okay. And for uh, Brad, did you ever come across one where like you just got emotionally involved in any of them? They 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 all um, in the aspect of the emotions is because you truly want to help these people because they're sure. actually to their wits end. They've gone to everybody in the world almost to get help and everybody's turned them away. And, um, I've always, uh, ever since I started this field, uh, have, um, looked at, you know, how would I feel if I was in their situation? And, um, you know just you feel for these people and you want to be there for them to help them because they're really truly good people right um, right that's the big thing yeah so it's hard to it's it, it's hard oh it is it's very hard okay and uh you know i've had uh father and i uh we never got to do uh sessions on her um but i got to do some deliverance prayers and deliverance stuff uh, I've had, uh, there's a lady in Indianapolis that passed away. She was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. And that was a case that uh, um, I really felt for her. And um, that was one of, actually, by thinking back, when Father and I first started working together, um, we really didn't start doing cases just where him and I were just working together straight on. Okay, I was actually helping a, a non-denominal guy and uh, from my area in Indianapolis area where I'm from, where I'm from. And uh, I would consult father about these cases. And uh -huh. then from there, 
once we had the case, and, and that was in 2015, I believe it was February 2015, um, where I actually traveled to Arizona uh, to help that woman uh, and brought her back on the airplane. That was a pretty intense case. And then after that, that's when we've just worked together, basically every case we've done. So nice. Uh, you know, it's nice that you guys, you know, work well, very well with each other. Um, mm -hmm. It's always very nice, especially in the field that you're in. I mean, you got to be going out there. People are distressed, you know, and they're crying and this and that. And, oh, my God, it's a very emotional oh, place. It, you know, and the thing is, what's nice is you, you, we get uh, invited in these people's homes and, and you know, uh, very nice people, you know. Um, uh, you know, but there's things that goes on with these people that just, you know, they don't under they don't they want to know why it's happening for one okay but two is they just really need help and and you know that's where sure. father comes so much is in you know helping with their faith because you know with him being a catholic priest that's you know and and that's huge i mean you know he's been a priest for 40 years now so um uh but uh the most important thing is just and it's like this in this field or any field you're in you just want to treat people the way you want to be treated and and oh. help people you know right. that's the big all right now you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna leave this on the on this mark i mean i know it's getting a little late tonight but uh one thing i always try to just tell people um about uh possession or stuff like that and evil spirits is that it is like you were saying brad about father is about faith and that Demons are real, and I agree that they are, but I don't think it's to the point where, like, the movie The Exorcist or anything like that. I believe it's when we let our defenses down in life. We slowly allow these things to enter in our lives, and they start to influence us. And a lot of people, usually it's family members who start to recognize, and oh, correct me if I'm wrong, Father. Uh, and then the minute that we start, I think of it as like a door. Slowly this door opens each and every day, and it gets wider and wider till it, it gets harder and harder to close it. Uh, would you agree with that? I kind of look more at the the paranormal activity that occurs and that is more um, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, what you're kind of describing is that there's a normal um, influence of the devil, which is temptation, which you can't prevent, uh, you know, but it is something you have to deal with with the normal uh, spiritual tools of the church and the Bible and, and things like that. You know, so that's at, at, under anyone's control. But when you get to extraordinary paranormal things happening, yeah, then there's more, uh, an involvement, some sort of uh, pact or um, some sort of ritual that was done. Um, it could be done by the person themselves. It could be done by someone else close to them that they have a relationship with. Um, it could also be done by generations, uh, you know, so... Uh, a mother to their daughter or father to their son or, you know, um, you know, parent to child type of thing. And, um, or it could be like a friend. And usually as long as the relationship's kind of going well, there's no problem. It's when the person no longer wants to be involved in that. That's when things kind of go haywire. Mm -hmm. And so then, then it becomes, Kind of a nasty thing which uh is going to try to stop you know stop them from pulling away or try to f force them to stay stay um in in contact now you 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 uh, what you're talking about is kind of like perfect possession and i hope i'm using the words correctly whereas someone they're they're possessed perfectly whereas they accept it now we, yeah, actually there may be one because you, you, yeah, to do an exorcism, you have to have the willingness of the person to be freed um, from that. They don't want to be freed from that ent entity. You can't do it because you have two wills going against one and it won't, right. uh, it won't work. So and, that falls you know, back into the realm of choice. Yeah. So, yeah. So they do have to want to be freed. And so it's usually a lot uh, it could be, yeah, they, they brought it on themselves by delving into, you know, the, the supernatural world with, you know, all kinds of different things. And and once it got in there, yeah, it doesn't want to leave, you know, and right. so it will fight it. 
Now, before it probably was a little more cooperative and trying to keep you to keep going further and further, but there might come a point of no return. I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, you know, it's getting to your thing keeps on asking them to do more and more. And they don't, and they can't do it anything more anymore. So then they want to get out and then it goes on the attack to keep them. And so, and that's kind of, it's at that point when they're on the attack that we get kind of called in and they, okay. and they want to leave, get it or get out. Or if they were cursed, they want, and they pulled away from the person who did that, that, yeah, then, then we, we have to use our means to, uh, spiritual means, uh, to try to free them from that. All right. Now, Father, one last thing, and then uh, we can call it a night. Uh, do you believe after Zach Bagans knocked on the house that that stopped all activity on those grounds? No. It was kind of a bad thing because it now opened up anyone to going and experiencing the thing. When it was, the house was locked in private property, he had control. And so whoever he would let into the house and things. And so... So it wasn't going to affect anyone. Now, when it was just an empty lot, yeah, anyone could kind of come in there and and try to experience whatever they want, you know, you know, think they could experience, and and it did affect a lot of people. So that if people have intent to want to go out there to try to communicate with this, more than likely something. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they they could. Yeah, they that's correct. They're open to it. And then, then I, so a lot of times I get called that they made this mistake and, and then ask me what they can do. And a lot of times they took some souvenir from there or something like that. So oh, um, cool. or it, sometimes it's just a picture or they you know, recorded things or whatever. They have to get rid of all that stuff, uh, whatever it is. Um, and I tell them how to do that, to be free as it, it goes with them. Uh, let me ask you, uh, by using the prayer, by saying, by the blood of Jesus Christ, as long as you have faith and you have the intention of um, putting that out into the environment, do you believe that that's a very good thing to utilize to uh, get rid of uh, anything evil or malicious? Yeah, you could always try to see what does send it away. It doesn't like religious things and prayers and, and such, and it aggravates it. And so it will you know, it will agitate it. Um, and if it does drive them away, um, there is a second thing which the exorcism does. And then it's probably the most important thing. It's called um, the binding right. It's an oath which sends the demon back to where it came from, never to return. And so then it, so you, you could do a lot of things that are deliverance, but it will leave because it doesn't like it. But it, but it doesn't prevent it from not coming back. So, okay. and it will try to come back to not let you, you know, hoping hoping it won't make you want to keep on having it leave. Um, but that's the best thing is um, when you do have it leave, you uh, should know to bind it never to return. That's an important part that does need to be ritual. You know, so whatever your prayers are, that get rid of it. You need to include that so it won't return. All right. To if they really have some issues going on, is there contact? Oh uh, yeah, they they could always call me by phone. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, my phone number area code two one nine nine three nine five six two seven. Okay, and it's okay to broadcast that on there, or do you want me sure. to just okay? Sure. All right, and uh, they can also get a hold of Brad Pate at any time, or they can just basically email me, Neil, at Graveside Paranormal, and I'll forward everything to uh, Brad. Uh, okay. Then we'll forward it to Mike, uh, Father Mike Maginot. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on tonight. It is getting kind of late. Thank both of you guys for coming on. And as always, boys and girls, boo. <laughs>